Good morning, God First family, and a big welcome to all of you who are joining us for the first time this morning. My name is Jermaine, and I'm a member at God First Bramfontein. In Psalm 66, verses 1 to 4, there's a beautiful invitation and charge. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. So church, this morning, as the band leads us, let's respond to this invitation through singing, raise your hands, shout, dance, and sing in praise of Him who loves us, who protects us, who serves us, and gives us life.
just been reflecting on communion and I've been reflecting of what it meant for, for, for the body and the blood to be shed and broken for us. What it meant when Jesus hung on that cross and said, it is finished. Um, I just felt to share the scripture, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 from verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. How amazing that Christ left this remembrance of, of what he did on the cross. Just let us just remember the cross, that when Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished, he really meant it is finished. He called us his sons and daughters in this victory, that we are justified in his name, that, 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 <laughs> that sin has no hold on us. So this morning I want to call us to remember the cross. Remember the cross. Praise you, Lord. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise you, Lord. <laughs> 
Jesus, we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you that you died. We thank you that you were raised from the dead on the third day. We thank you that you ascended into heaven. And there your word says you are interceding on our behalf. We praise you, God. We thank you for all that you have done. And everyone in their lounges said, Amen. Amen. It is great to have you with us this morning. Welcome. Uh, We love that you are here. Now, just uh, a reminder, if you are visiting us for the first time this morning, uh, let me quickly just say to you that it would be amazing for you to get plugged in, not just visit, but get plugged in into the God First community. And we have a number of ways that you could do that. One of the ways that you could do that is through social media. And you are able to do that at uh, by, by, by going into our Facebook page. You are able to connect by DMing us on Twitter. You're able to connect by coming onto our Insta page as well. Or you could just send us an email or uh, maybe even just send us a message on our, on our number. All of these details are up on your screen right now. And you can see them. You can screenshot them. You can take them down and make sure that you are no longer just visiting and checking us out, but you are becoming um, a member of our community or you are getting connected into our community. And we would love to introduce you and get you into our community. So that's very important. And we would love for you to do that. So please make sure that that happens. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I would love for us to do um, is I want to let you know what's going to be going on in the life of our church in the next coming weeks. The first thing that is, is a marriage course. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but this happens to me very often. Um, When I'm in the process of learning, I realize that the more I learn, the more I find out how much I don't know, and then the more I want to learn. With marriage course, I think it's a little bit similar, that it doesn't really matter how long you've been married for. It might be uh, maybe for a year, maybe for 10 years, or maybe for 20, 30 years. The more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know and the more you want to learn. And so I would encourage you to sign up. Join in on our marriage course. It's going to be starting on the 22nd of October. And it's going to be going on for about seven weeks, so please kind of block those days out in your calendar for the next seven weeks so that you are a part of that, so that you will have people who are journeying with you uh, and we're all learning together. This is very important for the life of your marriage. Uh, it's, It's not something that has to be broken for you to fix. It's something that even if it's not broken, you can be working on. So make sure that you send us an email Um, and you get uh, involved with that. The next thing that I want to let you know about is how things have been going here uh, in the hall at God First. Now, um, if you have done Get Connected at God First, whether more recently or a long time ago, you will know we always say this. Uh, The phrase kind of floats that we don't take ourselves seriously, but we take what we do very seriously. And actually in this hall right now, there is a team of men and women who are committed to making sure that you receive this message this morning. When it comes to getting the city, getting neighborhoods and nations to get and keep God first, we take this very seriously. And we would love for you to join in on this. We want you to get in on this because uh, this is very important. It's very important for us that this is happening. And it's very important that we do it well. So if you have any skills... Uh, that you think could be of use to us here, uh, please send us an email. Please let us know. But it's also important that you know that from this point on, since lockdown, we're actually not going to uh, go back at this point to just doing services. We're always going to need these skills. So if you feel like you've got time and you want to learn, we'd love for you to Also, just put your name down and come in and observe and see how things are going. 
uh, and, and take time to learn this extra skill because we're going to definitely need more and more of it. So make sure that you sign up. Uh, we'd love volunteers. If you've got time, you've got um, extra energy that you think, actually, I'd love to get involved here. Please make sure that you do that. For now, though, we're going to be carrying on with our series. And Don is ready, raring to go. Um, I'm really excited about uh, what we're going to be hearing from him. So please uh, get yourself comfortable in your couches, get yourself ready, um, and just prepare your heart um, as we hear this word that God might shape us um, and we might be directed or we might be taken to the right direction. I'm trusting uh, that God is going to be doing a lot of work in our hearts this morning. Uh, so let's please welcome Don. Thanks very much, Pula, for that. I'm just get myself comfortable here. Right, well, good morning. I trust that everyone is doing well in the month of October. Now, as I think of you watching me on that screen, I do wonder whether you are happy or you are satisfied with life. Are you satisfied with your station in life? Have you found true happiness? Has life turned out exactly how you have planned and dreamt and hoped it would be? Or is there some element of disappointment and disillusionment? And if you're a follower of Jesus, has, Christian li has the Christian life turned out to be everything you hoped it would be when you first said yes to Jesus? Are you living the abundant life? I ask these questions because I see a lot of dissatisfaction all around me. People are dissatisfied in their relationships. It, it is the reason why people would break up or get divorced. It is the reason why people abuse drugs and alcohol to escape from some form of pain. It is the reason why you change jobs or careers for something else. It's the reason why you could be considering leaving South Africa or taking your child out of one school and into another. It's the reason why we have so many service delivery protests. Dissatisfaction could be the reason why you would abandon the support of one political party for another. It could very well be the reason why when you stand in front of the mirror, you say to yourself, ooh, I think I need a better diet plan because you don't quite like what you see. People are dissatisfied. So I ask the question again, are you satisfied with your life? And if you're not quite sure how to answer that, I promise you that this morning, the Bible will be of great help to you as we continue in our series on the Gospel of John. This morning in John chapter 6, we see that Jesus has become quite the enigma in town. He is the talk of the town. Everyone is following him because of the miraculous healings on the sick. Now, unbeknown to these people, Jesus is about to take them on a journey where they will discover that he is more than just the miracle man. And so starting in verse 1 of John 6, it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover... The feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread. That's about eight months worth of wages. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? This is a test of faith. Do they really know Jesus, or is their thinking pretty much like the rest of the crowd? Jesus had turned water into wine, right before their very eyes. 
Could Philip perhaps have said to Jesus, well, what is the need for us to be buying bread? Can't you just turn the stones into bread? Well, Philip and Andrew are exposed of their unbelief. They both fail the test. Both of them see the impossible. For Philip, it was the lack of money. And for Andrew, it was limited resources. And so Jesus uses this opportunity to teach them who he really is. And it says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Notice, it's 5,000 men. This doesn't even include the women and the children. So there is probably about eight or 10,000 people that are here. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then, what, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, what has just happened here? Jesus has demonstrated that there is no limit to his provision. Whether it is 5,000 or 50,000, Jesus is sufficient to the task of fully satisfying the needs of everyone. The people are excited. Their faith is stirred. But sadly, this faith is selfish. It is misdirected. And even though they are saying this could be the prophet who was to come, they actually want to make Jesus king. Imagine having a king who has an endless supply of food. This is what the guys were thinking. He would be a useful king. But Jesus didn't come to be useful. Jesus came to be treasured. And so the next day, they go looking for Jesus again. And when they find him, he says to them, he calls them out and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they say to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in whom, him whom he has sent. And so Jesus calls them out saying, you guys are not here because you understood the sign that I performed yesterday. You guys are here simply because I met an important need of yours. I filled your belly. You are here for another free meal. And that right there is the picture of fallen mankind. Now, when we use the term fallen mankind, we are referring to mankind disconnected from God because of sin. What does fallen mankind care about? Fallen mankind cares about the natural and not the spiritual, cares about the temporal and not the eternal, cares about the full belly, but never the clean heart. But because Jesus is full of grace and truth, he doesn't leave this crowd in their misdirected faith. And as the good shepherd that he is, he begins to lead them to the pastures of truth. He promises a better satisfaction. In fact, he warns them about the, the dangers and the foolishness of pursuing the wrong type of food, food that fills you today and leaves you hungry tomorrow. Imagine having a supply of food that never perishes. There's no expiry date, and no matter how much you eat of it, it never runs this is what Jesus is talking about. Food not just to satisfy your body, but food that nourishes 
your soul, and your spirit. And what Jesus is saying is, do not be content with that which satisfies you just physically. Rather, seek eternal nourishment, seek eternal satisfaction for your whole being, body, soul, and spirit. Now, the world has convinced us that there is no free lunch. So, the, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be surprised that the people here are asking Jesus, so, so what do we need to do? What work do we need to perform for us to get this food that endures to eternal life? And what they don't realize is actually they completely missed what Jesus has said in saying that the Son of Man, which is a term that Jesus used of himself, the Son of Man will give you this food, will give you this eternal life. In other words, it is free. And what Jesus is saying is faith is the doorway to eternal satisfaction. If one would believe in or trust in the one that God has sent, which is himself. And so the story goes on. So they say to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They say to him, Sir, give us this bread always. This is shocking. It is shocking, shocking, shocking. I mean, 24 hours earlier, Jesus has performed probably one of his greatest miracles. This crowd was witness to this miracle. They were there. They were excited. Their faith was stirred. And they were saying, this should be the prophet who God has, has sent. In fact, they even wanted to make Jesus king. And yet here, they come again and they say, actually, they've got the audacity to say, well, will you perform another miracle? We need another sign from you that we might believe you. Now, don't rush to judge them because we do this all the time. Whenever our hearts choose anything other than Christ, we are asking him to prove that he is worthy of our devotion. Whenever our lives are overrun by fear and anxiety and worry, we are asking Jesus to prove that he is who he says he is and that he can be trusted. It's not a sign that we need. It's trust that we need. And then the people take Jesus down and they dig into the archives of Jewish history when the Israelites were trekking through the desert, through the wilderness, after God had delivered them and rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And through that time, God sustained them uh, by giving them a kind of bread called manna, with bread from heaven that they saved. The story is found in, in the book of Exodus in chapter 16 in the Old Testament. And so what they are saying is our forefathers believed that Moses was a prophet because Moses provided a sign. He gave our forefathers bread from heaven. And so we believed him because of this sign. Jesus says, ah, uh -uh, no, no, no. Let me correct you there. It wasn't Moses who gave you the bread. Actually, it was my father. And what Jesus is saying, how is it possible that you can believe that Moses was a prophet, that the, there was this sign, and yet you completely miss the sign that is before you, this greater sign that God has given to you, the bread that God himself, my Father, has sent to you. In other words, standing before you here is a prophet that is greater than Moses. And then Jesus makes an invitation that is irresistible. And he says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, I am the end of your search for satisfaction. I am not just who, I am not just what I do, I am 
who you need. I am not just the source of your eternal nourishment. I am your nourishment. And Jesus is calling on their faith to accept this invitation to what is true satisfaction. Now, I don't know about you, but in my house there must always be bread. We are pretty content to be short of other foodstuffs, but there must always be a loaf of bread around. And often my girls will come to me and say, Dad, we, we are hungry. And they want a little snack in between the meals. And depending on what is there, if the options are limited, Dad will usually just say, go get some bread. And in fact, in Jesus' time and in many countries and cultures today, bread is a staple diet. It is essential for life. So the Jews here are under no illusion as to what Jesus is stating. He is simply saying, I am essential for life. This life and life into eternity. And our eternal union with Jesus means that every need and every desire of ours is fully satisfied in Him. He fully satisfies our hunger. He satisfies our longing for identity. He satisfies our hunger for acceptance and approval, for purpose and meaning and freedom in life. He satisfies our longing for relationship where we are loved unconditionally. He satisfies our longing for security and peace and hope and our longing for eternal life in heaven. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. This is an open invitation. It's not a once-off invitation. It's an invitation to come to him daily. Jesus as the daily bread. Coming to him for daily sustenance, daily nourishment. In the same way that the Israelites, as they trekked through the wilderness, they depended on God to provide the manna for them daily. You know, there is an old Christian song called Breathe. And one of the lines in there goes, this is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And it is through Scripture. It is through the Word of God. Scripture, Bible, it is through reading it and, and studying it and hearing what God is saying. It is through that that our souls are nourished. And so when we withdraw from the Word of God, we become spiritually malnourished. You will not find nourishment in money, in privilege, in power, in pleasure, in career, in your job, in relationships, in social media. All those things are temporary. Jesus is eternal. Whoever comes to me, it's an open invitation to all. The reason why Jesus performed his miracle and fed 5,000 people was to demonstrate that he can fully satisfy all. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus, this morning I plead with you to accept his invitation. Come out of the crowd. Because people in the crowd spend all of their lives chasing satisfaction with things that are temporary, things that can be taken away from them. Eternal satisfaction is found in him who can never be taken away from you. And his name is Jesus. Say yes to him. If you are a believer, let me leave you with a promise of Luke chapter 6 verse 21 where it says, Blessed are you who are hungry now for you shall be satisfied. You know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will almost always ask you how your appetite is. Because a lack of appetite is a sure sign of a deeper health problem. So it is with God. A lack of appetite for God and the things of God is a sign of a deeper spiritual problem. And I want to implore you this morning that you would cry out to God to protect your appetite for Him, your desire for Him. Because you know that there are many things that are demanding of your time and your attention. And it's easy for the appetite of God to wane. 
cry that you would come to him daily, hungry for him, because only he can fully satisfy you. Say no to spiritual malnourishment and yes to eternal satisfaction. And in fact, why don't you after this service have communion, whether it's you're just by yourself, you're with friends or with family, have communion. And with the breaking of bread, we usually and we normally, and is, as instructed by Jesus, we do that to celebrate his victory for us on the cross. But I want you to do it. And do it for the next three days. Have communion every single day for the next three days. And do that as a restating of your trust in Jesus, that he is the bread of life, and that all your desires, all that you long for, are fully satisfied in him. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, the bread of life. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our eternal satisfaction. Eternal satisfaction is found in you. I want to pray for those who are watching who do not know you, who don't have a relationship with you yet. I pray that you would cause faith to rise in them right now, that they would accept the invitation to true satisfaction. I pray, Lord, for believers, those who have believed in you, those who follow you. I pray, God, that you would protect their appetite for you and the things of God. I pray that, Lord, day by day, they would come to you hungry, expecting that you would satisfy them. I pray, Lord, for an experience like they've never known before, that true satisfaction is found in no one else but you. I pray this in your precious name. Amen. Well, have a great Sunday. Have a great week. Break bread. Have communion. And, uh, and have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week.